Welcome back to Print and Play Projects. Now, when we last left off, we had identified all the hardware we needed to build a miniaturized version of my Ready Printer 1 3D printed arcade cabinet. We did the design work and we even got our software loaded so that it'll be ready to go. Well, since then, my 3D printers have been working overtime and now I have all the parts. So there's only one step left. Let's put it together. But first, through the magic of video time travel, we're gonna get to see the finished cabinet because it's a 30 minute assembly process and I don't wanna make you guys wait. So stay tuned and we're gonna get right to that here on Print and Play Projects. Oh, I should have said assemble. Well, it looks like all of that prototyping and designing and 3D printing and wiring has really paid off because I have an absolutely beautiful miniaturized version of my Ready Printer 1 arcade cabinet. I've gone for a Captain America theme on mine with his shield as the back and even incorporated the Avengers logo underneath the screen. As an added bonus, the arrow on the A indicates which way to rotate the screen when switching between the horizontal and vertical orientation. The six button layout provides ample input. Whether you're into playing games from the 80s or 90s, you're going to be hard pressed to find too many games this cabinet can't handle. As you can see here, the foot soldiers in this game never stood a chance. And of course, just like its big brother, when height is what you need, the screen rotates a full 90 degrees. That way if you're playing horizontal or vertical games, you never have to deal with black bars and you get to use all of that screen real estate. Since it uses a 4 wide by 3 tall screen, all the classic games look just the way they should, just like they did in the original arcade. And of course, no arcade design's ever complete for me until I've played some 1943 on it. After all, it's the whole reason I got into vertical games in the first place, so it's only fitting. controls on this cabinet are great. The joystick's movement is nice and smooth, the buttons are properly spaced, and they don't require a lot of force, which is good because the last thing you want during a long game is finger fatigue. The truth is I could spend hours playing this cabinet, and I probably will, but first I want to show you how it was made. My favorite place to start with almost all of my arcade builds is with the control panel. So for this step, you're going to need the control panel base, the control panel itself, your buttons, so you've got six full-size ones and then two small ones, your joystick, your interface, the ball for your joystick, the dust shield if you're going to use it, and uh, the wires that came with your kit. So this is a fun step because it really brings the actual project together and it's kind of a minimal amount of effort. So we'll start off with the control panel. And all you have to do is snap your buttons into place. Try and set it so the pins are always sort of towards the bottom and just push and repeat. With our six buttons in place, now we can go ahead and mount up the joystick. Uh, the length of the screws for this is gonna be pretty variable. Uh, you basically need something that's at least long enough to come out the bottom with the joystick sitting there and have a room for at least two nuts on there because we need to be able to tighten two nuts against each other so that they don't work their way loose. So go ahead and find some screws that are the proper length and with the joystick sitting to the side, start screwing them into the panel, get all four of them mounted and we'll be ready to position the joystick. So I ended up using 24 millimeter screws for this and they should work just perfect. 
So with our post installed, we can go ahead and put our joystick into place. So I'm sliding the joystick onto the post with the connection point for the wires facing in towards the panel. So this is what will actually go towards the interface and allow us to connect our joystick to the Raspberry Pi. So for this step, you're also gonna need uh, eight nuts and then optionally, but if you have them, you can also use some M3 washers and just place them over top of it. Uh, they'll distribute the weight of the uh, nut a little bit more when we tighten it down. And that way you don't have to worry about the nut working its way throughout the joystick panel and coming loose. Uh, so toss a washer onto each if you have it and then go ahead and put two nuts onto each post. Okay, with two nuts on each side, you're gonna go ahead and grasp the bottom one with something like a pair of needle nose and the top one with any additional set of pliers you have and essentially what you're going to do is twist them so they screw into each other so just applying as much pressure as you can it's a little awkward the smaller your pliers at this point the more successful you will be the alternative for here would be to use a lock nut uh, and that would work just as well in this case, if not better. So if you have some of those handy as well, go ahead and switch to those. Okay, we can go ahead and place our control panel aside for a couple minutes. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and install our smaller buttons into the base of the control panel. It's the same affair as before. You're just essentially gonna line them up, push them in, and they should lock into place. Now, if any of these are particularly loose or you feel like they're gonna work their way free, which they shouldn't, pressure fit's usually good enough, uh, you can go ahead and add a little hot glue around the edges of them just to make sure they stay in place. All the force is gonna be inwards on these anyway, so the likelihood of them pulling back out is pretty minimal. Next, we'll be looking to mount our interface card, which is gonna go back here in these four screws. Now, these ones take two millimeter screws and the holes are pretty tight. So if you're unable to get yours to thread, you may wanna use a drill to bore them out a little bit, just to make sure you don't accidentally break the posts off with the force of the screws going in. So I'm gonna go ahead and do it on this one and then we'll get to installing that card. With all our holes bored out, we can go ahead and install the card. So I like to install it with the interface for the USB and the joystick up top and the spots for us to connect our buttons on the bottom. Let's go ahead and line the screws up, or the screw holes up rather. And uh, you can use your M2, uh, six millimeters should be all you need, uh, and go ahead and screw it in. For this step, you're also gonna want the star of the attraction, your Raspberry Pi with your SD card, which has already been loaded with RetroPie. So we'll be installing this into the control panel at the same time. Now, before we install our Pi, one of the things I find helpful is to take a longer screw and just create the threads by essentially turning the screw into the holes where the Pi is gonna mount. So what this does is create the threads ahead of time so that when we're installing the Pi, we're not trying to fight with positioning and threading these holes at the same time. Now do remember, we are threading this into plastic. The plastic is what's going to be able to hold the screw in place. So you don't wanna over tighten these whatsoever because if you strip the holes here, then you're gonna to have to find a different way to secure it. So just a few extra turns, getting it in there, getting it started, and then back it off and we'll be ready to install our Pi. With the holes pre-threaded, now we can go ahead and install our Pi. The other thing I find useful is putting the M3, in this case, six millimeter screws through the Pi uh, before we get started. Each of the holes on here is just large enough to be able to take an M3. In fact, the M3s are going to thread through the actual board as we go. So it's helpful to have them installed and ready to go beforehand. Uh, that way you can just sort of position it into place and those holes should line up perfectly with the Pi. In fact, you can see with them threaded through slightly, it's not moving. You're gonna position it so your ethernet and USB are facing towards the back of the control panel and your micro USB card is facing towards the front and uh, it's accessible through a hole in the base. That way we can upgrade RetroPie on here without, without ever having to disassemble our unit. So with it in position, go ahead and tighten down your screws. With our Pi screwed into place, we can now go ahead and put the control panel over top. At this point, you can install the dust guard for your joystick as well as the joystick ball itself, which just screws on top. And we're not gonna do any of the wiring right now. We're gonna move on to the screen and we'll do all the wiring at the final step. This really gives us a chance to take a look at how our project's gonna look when it's completed. And I'm really digging the red, white, and blue scheme on mine. And I'm hoping that you're digging the scheme on yours as well. All right, next, let's move on to the screen. So for this step, we're gonna need the screen body, the screen holder, the 
uh, mount that holds the screen into place. Obviously the screen itself with its interface board. And we're gonna need our rollers, which are gonna allow the screen to rotate. And we're gonna need some M5 16 millimeter screws to secure those into place. So we can start off by positioning our screen. Now my screen was damaged in shipping. So unfortunately I've had to do a little repair. So your screen shouldn't look at all like this. Uh, mine had some damage to the bottom. So I was able to fix up the connections. So you're gonna mount it so that the ribbon cable goes down towards the bottom. There's a notch cut out here to allow the ribbon cable to be able to pass without getting pinched. And it should just fit into place with a little bit of pressure. Before we start the assembly process here, let's go ahead and pre-thread our four holes here, as well as you can thread the ones that are on here. The ones on here aren't as big of a deal because you're going to be pushing through the plastic here anyways, but since when we marry these two up, these need to be able to bite in easily, it really helps to pre-thread these with a longer screw. With our holes pre-threaded, we can go ahead and secure this into place with some M3 10 millimeter screws. So four in each corner. And uh, just make sure that the part that sticks out on this piece that holds the screen into place is pointing down towards the ribbon cable. At this point, our screen is installed. And then unfortunately, only now do you realize that you've left the protective plastic on the screen, which means that you're gonna have to take apart the back, remove that, and then put it back together. Hopefully you've watched the entire video beforehand, in which case I just saved you some time. And if not, well, I apologize. So with our screen secured into place, we can now look at adding the interface board for it. Now I've received two different versions of these screens, even though they had the same part number. On some of them, the ribbon cable just comes off and goes straight into the board. And in other ones, they've got this additional interface card. So essentially this converts the smaller pin layout into something that's more generic that this board can take. And it's probably cheaper for them to manufacture because then they can stick with sort of one board for multiple screens. So you have a couple options if yours has got the extra here. You can essentially just plug it straight in and uh, you can try and tie up the extra slack. What I like to do is wrap it around the board once so that I don't have to deal with the extra slack off there. If you have enough slack coming off the bottom cable, you can either secure this with a little bit of hot glue to the back of the screen here, or just to be safe, you may want to put a little uh, hot glue or double side tape or whatever across the back here to cover up the pins. This is still a board. There are still exposed traces and you don't want to accidentally short anything out. So with your cable positioned, however you want to do it, in my case, I'm actually going to leave it out and I will add electrical tape around it so that it doesn't accidentally short out of place, but I will still run the ribbon cable underneath, loop it back into place, and I'm going to stick the ribbon cable into the port on the bottom. And you'll find that on yours, there will be a brown bar across the bottom and that's the locking mechanism. So all you have to do is push down onto it. It'll push into place. It puts pressure against the ribbon cable pushes it up and makes it make contact with the pins on the inside. So with your HDMI and VGA pointing up and the spot for the ribbon cable pointing down, and of course with your board secured so that it doesn't actually short out against anything, you're going to go ahead and position it with your M3 screws going through the holes into the post and you'll use M3 six millimeters to secure this into place. So we'll go ahead and do that and we'll move on to the next step. Well, now that our screen's installed into the screen bezel and its control board has been securely installed onto the piece that holds it into place, we can actually put the top of the unit together. So we're gonna start off with our screen bezel face down on our desk, make sure there's nothing underneath it that's gonna scratch our screen, and we'll bring in the screen body. Now the screen body has a post that comes off the back of it, and you're gonna to wanna to make sure that that post ends up in between the two posts that stick off the screen bezel. These are what prevent it from rotating more than 45 degrees. So we'll go ahead and drop into position and anywhere is fine as long as that post is located between these two. Next, we're gonna to wanna to bring in our bearings and they're designed to sit on the four posts that are located all the way around the screen bezel. 
So we go ahead and position them and just make sure that they sit in the track and on top of those posts. Finally, we're gonna bring in our M5 16 millimeter bolts and those should th thread straight through and we should be able to screw them into the post on the screen bezel. So we'll get all four of those installed and then this screen will be able to freely rotate. A quick note to those of you that are going to install EL wire on your cabinet. You'll find that the bottom post has a cutaway and there will be a hole through the front. So essentially what you'll do is you'll run the EL wire up from the control panel and it'll go through the hole here, then all the way around the bezel and then back through here where you'll be able to uh, basically glue it off and tie it off. So to install the L wire, you'll either want to leave this bolt out or you'll have to remove it uh, before you actually install it because it is tucked away in behind here. And with the bearings installed, the main part of the top cabinet is done. You can see it'll rotate between the two positions. And there's notches in the track that allow the wheel to sit in it so that it doesn't accidentally roll. So it doesn't require a ton of force to turn it, but it's just enough that the weight of the wires is never going to be enough to spin it around. Well, to assemble the marquee, we're going to need our completed screen module. Uh, we're going to need the marquee hatch, the marquee itself, obviously, and the marquee holder. Also, to save us some time later on in the build, since we're going to have to use the hot glue gun for this, I've also included the speaker grills and the speakers, which are going to get hot glued together. While our hot glue gun is warming up, we can go ahead and get our pieces ready for gluing. So the speakers just slide right into the speaker grills. And the marquee should fit just fine into the marquee holder, just like that. For the speakers, we'll go ahead and take some hot glue and we'll put it... I like to put it where the sort of metal crossbars here hit. It's just to prevent any glue from actually getting into the speaker itself, because that would definitely adversely affect the sound. Also remember that you're gluing this to PLA, most likely PLA. You could have printed yours out of PETG. But don't put so much glue that you're going to end up damaging or, dis or warping the plastic. With the marquee, I like to just put a little dollop of glue in each of the corners. It doesn't take much to hold it into place. There's not going to be a lot of force applied to here. So just sort of wherever you can get it in. Try to make sure the glue doesn't spread out beyond the border because then it'll be visible when the light's on depending on how you've printed yours. You can set your speakers aside for now and uh, we can go ahead and attach the marquee holder with the mounted marquee to the top of our screen module. So essentially you're going to line up the screw holes on the marquee holder with the screws that are coming out of here. Again, it may be easier to thread these beforehand so that the screws don't have to create the threads as they go. Simply line it up, grab your Allen key, and start turning. Now it's time to install our LED strip. So the strip's going to go into the actual back of the marquee panel. Uh, you'll see there's these legs that are set up here, so it should feed in between them in the space here. Um, you're going to want to make sure that you leave sort of as much slack as possible. I usually leave one LED pointing down and I start here at the bottom like that. So there's an adhesive strip on the back here, which will probably be more than enough to hold it on. So you'll go ahead and peel off this 3M strip, slide it into the compartments like this and just work it around. Uh, occasionally you'll probably hit a spot where an LED light will line up with one of those posts and essentially you can just sort of flex it and work it back and forth and you should have virtually no trouble getting it all the way around. With our LED strip installed, we'll go ahead and if you didn't do it previously, feed the USB cable into the screen assembly and we want to pull all of that slack all the way down and we're going to rotate our marquee hatch and slide into position. Now pretty well fi friction fits there, but there are screw holes provided on the sides that will allow you to permanently install that hatch in the back. So if you're going to do that, just go ahead and put some short like M3 eight millimeter screws into the sides and you won't have to worry about that ever slipping loose. Now would be an excellent time to reward some of your hard work by seeing how this is going to look. So you can go ahead and plug USB power into your lights and you get to see your lit up marquee for the first time. Next, we're going to go ahead and attach the base to the unit. So when installing the base, you want to make sure that this hole, which is for the menu button, is facing forward and the rear hatch is facing to the back. So you'll find that there's four cutouts in the bottom of the screen. There was originally going to be four screws, but unfortunately two of the screws come out directly into the track. So instead we're just going to have the two in the back. 
Because of this, you're going to want to use something like an M3 30mm screw in order to secure this and make sure that it's got, well, lots of flexibility and doesn't get broken off. So you should be able to feed your USB cable for your lights down into the base, and then lining up on the bottom, this should just slide in without too much hassle. So then we'll take our M3 30mm screws and they install through the holes here and here. Tilt, tilt that so you can get a better view. And they'll go down through the base. So we'll get those installed and move on to the next step. Now we get to the only part of this project that's going to require soldering. And technically you could probably find speakers of the same size that already have wires attached to them or ones that you can crimp wires onto. So it's pot potentially possible to avoid this step, but it's not very complicated. So I recommend you give it a shot. So you're going to need some lengths of wire. Uh, this is a little bit less than six inches. It should be more than enough. And essentially what you're going to do is you're going to strip off the insulation on both sides. Doesn't take a ton. Then you go ahead and twist the strands of wires together. At this point, you're going to need your soldering iron nice and hot. And of course, you're going to need some solder. We'll start off by adding solder to each of the uh, points on the speaker. Then we'll also add solder to the wires. At this point here, you can trim off some of the excess wire. You really only need about six millimeters to seven millimeters worth of wire actually exposed. And then finally, you can position your wires and melt the solder together. And that's it. Just repeat it for the second speaker and all your solder work is done. With our speakers soldered and ready to go, we can just go ahead and feed them into the cabinet. Now, these are most likely going to be okay friction fit, but you can add a little bit of hot glue to the inside just to make sure that they don't move around. Go ahead and position them the way you like, push them into place, and they're ready to go. Well, now it's time for the front and the back of this unit to meet. So we'll bring our control panel back. We'll remove the control panel section of it, and that'll leave us with the base. So what you're going to find is there are two grooves in the front of the bottom of the unit, and there's two grooves in the back of the control panel. So you should be able to just line those up and sort of make sure that they're perfectly lined up and push them together. Just like that. Now, if your prints are accurate and everything's good, there are four screw holes here on the inside that should now line up. So what I recommend is uh, screwing in from the back of the unit through here and uh, you need probably 20, 25 millimeter screws there. This is another spot where you can use longer than what you need if you're trying to get rid of some of them. So uh, feel free. So we'll flip the unit over. And unfortunately the view is gonna be super difficult to see, but you'll be able to see the screw holes. Oh, well, not really, but <laughs> they are there. And we'll go ahead and put our screws in and uh, we'll be back after that. Next, we're going to get started on our rear I.O. So the panel has a spot for power input, an optional USB header, which will allow you to use something like a USB stick to copy ROMs to your Pi later on, and a hole for the volume knob to stick out. So we'll go ahead and take a look at the audio amplifier before we install it. So on one side, we have our volume knob with a retaining nut. And on the other side, we have auxiliary in, which is a headphone style connector. We have uh, clamping connectors for the speaker. So you have left and right, and they just tighten down onto the wires using a flathead screwdriver. And you have power in, which is just a standard micro USB power. So we'll start off by removing the retaining nut. Then we can simply slide it into place like so. And then to hold it in, we'll put the retaining nut back on. And from there, we're going to add some three millimeter 
uh, by say six or eight millimeter screws in through here just to make sure this is nice and secure. Uh, you can see it wobbles around a little bit with ex without the extra support. There won't be a lot of pressure put on this but uh, we'll get it nice and secure and come back. Okay I went ahead and secured that with two screws. There are holes for all four but you should be fine just putting in the two rear ones. So next we can go ahead and put in our optional USB header. So essentially there is a slot cut through. You're going to feed the wire through, move it all the way around, and then line up the clamping notches on the top and bottom of the USB, as you can see here and here, with the notches cut into this. And we should be able to essentially just line up, push, and it should snap right into place. And that's pretty secure. Finally, for the power, well, we're going to have to feed the power in. I wanted to have a header panel on the back here that would allow us to unplug and plug the power from the back, but unfortunately, all the ones I tried didn't get enough power to the Pi and would have caused stability issues. So we're going to hardwire it through. So essentially, you run your USB power in through here. Make sure you leave yourself enough slack to be able to reach the Pi. Uh, and you just cable tie this into place so that it can't slide back out. I usually don't cable tie this until the sort of last step when I'm uh, putting this panel in uh, to its final place. That way you don't have to worry about having to readjust this later on. Add a set of wires to each of the buttons on your control panel one at a time and uh, then we'll worry about wiring them up to the control panel. Now each of the buttons has a pattern on the contacts on one side. You can see it there. So what you want to do is with your connector you want to place it so the not cut side is on the same side as that pattern and slide it over. And that'll lock into place and won't come off easily. If you ever have to release it, you can push on the tab underneath and with just a little bit of pressure, it'll come right off. With your six buttons wired, we'll also want to add the wiring for the joystick. So the wiring for the joystick has two notches on it and uh, there's corresponding notches cut into the body of the joystick itself. So just line up the notches, push, and it will click into place. Don't forget to add two wires to the buttons on the inside of your control panel as well. And you're going to wire, want to wire a third one. It's going to go up here. Um, I don't like to install it until all the rest of the wiring is done because sometimes being able to get your fingers into this hole and move wires around is actually pretty helpful. So that's usually the last step I follow before uh, closing up the control panel for the last time. Next, we're going to want to connect the power and the HDMI to our screen. And then go ahead and feed the USB power and the HDMI cable into the base of the unit through the hole in the bottom. And pull them out into the control panel section. Next, if you're going to need more than the dedicated four USB ports on the Pi, we, meaning that you're using like the accessory USB port in the back, or you're going to be running EL wire or a combination of the two, now is a good time to install your USB hub. So I'd recommend connecting things to the USB hub that aren't that crucial. Uh, so I like to put the lights or the LED system for the marquee in there as well as EL wire if I'm going to be running it uh, and the USB port the additional one since it won't be used all the time. Go ahead and connect the HDMI up to your Pi and we're also going to go ahead and connect the power for the screen. That'll go directly into the Pi since it's going to be a high power consumption device and we want to make sure that it's getting power right from the unit. With the HDMI and power connected to your screen through the Pi, we can go ahead and bundle up the additional wire in the back of the screen assembly. So I like to put all the excess HDMI cable here. Um, ideally, you'll have as short as one as possible. And when you're bundling this up, you want to make sure that none of the wires are going to catch onto the ribbon cable or are going to interfere by getting in the track or uh, interfering with the posts that lock it into the two different positions. So go ahead and do a couple of test spins just to make sure that everything is good. And if it is, you're ready to move on to the next step. Go ahead and get your audio cable and we're going to connect it to the audio jack on the Pi. And then we'll feed the other end through the hole and out the back. In the back of the unit, if you're using the optional USB header, we're going to go ahead and feed the USB cable through into the main part of the unit. And we'll go ahead and connect our audio cable into our amplifier. We're going to connect the speakers now. so. These two are the terminals for the left, and these two are the terminals for the right, which is probably going to be reversed from the way they are in the cabinet. So we'll connect this side to these terminals, which is simply loosening these terminal, wire, er, terminal screws, inserting your wire, and tightening it down until it clamps, and repeating the process for all four wires. 
Next, let's take our power cord for the Pi and go ahead and run it through into the control box. And plug it into the Pi itself. Finally, we can connect our power cable to the amplifier. And feed it through into the control box as well. You can pull all the excess wire for each of these cables through into the control box. And then just before actually screwing this panel in, we're going to place our power cable in the channel and secure it with a cable tie so that if anything happens and pulls the power cord, we're not putting direct pressure on the Pi. And secure the rear panel into place. Now the wiring in there is pretty tight, so be careful when you're putting it together. You don't want to end up pinching any wires or anything like that. Um, just take your time and you should be able to get everything packed into that very small space. Now we'll go ahead and install the fan into our control panel. So we're going to start off by feeding some M3 16 millimeter bolts through the holes here. And basically we want them to poke through just enough that we can line up the fan on the back. Uh, we'll finish screwing them in after we have our nuts in place. Next we'll flip the deck over and we're going to go ahead and put an M3 nut into each of the holes on the fan. With all four nuts in place, we'll go ahead and line it up over top of the screws and then we just have to tighten them down. Now we can begin wiring up the rest of the control panel. So if you look at the control panel controller, you're going to find a bunch of two connect or two pin connectors across the bottom. These are for the buttons and it doesn't really matter which ones go where. So you'll want to plan it so that like the button in the front here is going to go pr uh, probably to the furthest one away and you'll want to reserve the one on this end for the button on the control panel over here. Other than that, you can plug them in any order you want. Uh, other things of note is that the USB connection is right here uh, and the joystick connection is right here. Uh, both of these will only plug in one way and other than that, yeah, put the buttons in whatever order you want. We're going to map them in software anyways. So we'll go ahead and plug in our USB cable into the board. Then I like to leave just enough slack that I can get it over into this area here and sort of tuck it underneath the corner. I'm running the cable around the outside. I'm going to plug into one of the HDMI ports on the Pi. And we can also plug in our audio amplifier while we're here. We can take our front right button and plug it into the furthest port away right here. And we'll plug the left one in to the one that's the closest to it. We'll also want to run the wires for our third control button down through the hole and then out through the hole in the bottom. And we can go ahead and feed that and plug that into the second furthest one from the outside and position our wire or button and snap it into place. We'll bring our control panel in and one by one we're going to plug the buttons in. I find it easier to plug the buttons in before the joystick because then we have the extra slack um, from the wires when we're pushing them in over here. If you have the USB port on the back, don't forget to plug it into your hub because you won't be able to go back and edit the video to make it look like you did it the first time like I did. Now before connecting our joystick, we're going to want to connect the power to the fan. We're going to be using the Raspberry GPIO to do that. Uh, this has all sorts of input outputs, but it also provides power. So going into the top corner here, this is a five volt pin. The next one directly next to it is also five volts. And then this is ground. So the second and third pin in that are the ones that we're interested in because they're side by side and all we need is five volts and ground to run our fan. So you can take the connector from your fan and simply slide it down over those pins with the red wire on the five volts and the black wire on the ground. You should see one pin still visible on this side and then obviously many on this side. And then just make sure that it is on the outside rail so you can see all the pins on the bottom. The final step before screwing the control panel into place is to connect your joystick up. And unfortunately this is definitely going to cover it up but you can see I've connected it there. And then it's just a matter of trying to manage the cables as much as you can to make sure none of them are in the way and work your control panel back. With your control panel in place, it's time to give a final prayer to the gods of blue smoke and plug your machine in for the first time. If everything's wired correctly, it should come up and say welcome and tell you that it's detected a gamepad. Then to configure your gamepad, you're going to go press and hold a button. 
And we'll just walk through the menu. Up, down, left, right. Start, select. Then we can do whatever order you want to do the buttons in. If your cabinet started up successfully, then it's time to secure everything in place. Make sure your wiring is as clean as it can be for a rat's nest. And then we'll use some M3 8, 10, or 12 millimeter screws around the outer edge. And of course, install our rear screen hatch. Well, that's it. Another print and play product is in the bag. And honestly, I couldn't be any more excited about the way it turned out. I really feel like I managed to capture the aesthetic of the full-size cabinet in an itty-bitty living space. So what did you guys like or not like about this build? Is there stuff that you would have done differently? Have you built an arcade cabinet before? Well, let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to stay tuned until next time because we're going to be building an Arduino-based control system for our streams. And it's really something that can be expanded to pretty much any other application. I'm really excited to get it done and I think you guys are going to love it. Well, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to toss me a thumbs up. And if you're new here and excited for my new projects the way I am, well, then subscribe and click the bell so you'll get to watch them as soon as they come out. Alrighty, well, that's it for this week. And until next time, stay creative.